Hi guys, let's do a bit of subnets. Uh, right, little shirt. I've, I've, we've moved. We've changed the feng shui of this. I'm going to stand away. That still is annoying. It's, I can hear myself as I talk. Uh, but I'm going to stand here-ish. Here's good. Uh, and uh, now we're going to get into subnets. Uh, hands up if you were are new to the room. Did not see my amazing first session. Hands up. Don't be embarrassed. It's very good. You missed an absolutely brilliant session. Um, but this is even better, which is the good thing. Um, so um, first, what I didn't do at the end of the first se session is take any general questions. Does anyone have any general questions? I have no idea what's going on. Who is this British person talking to me about Avalanche? Any general questions, first and foremost? Good. Good. Question. That is the best question. <laughs> like, like, this man wants to watch Netflix in the third row. <laughs> I advise that. Uh, he will help you with Wi-Fi because I actually don't know the Wi-Fi, which I should do. Uh, any other Wi-Fi or non-Wi-Fi based questions? Good. If you have any specific questions, uh, not about the Wi-Fi, uh, you can ask me afterwards. Uh, it is actually lunch after this. I'm the session before lunch. Uh, and then you're rid of me for the day. Uh, so you can come and talk to me over lunch. Uh, so we're going to run till about 12.10, I believe it is. Uh, then it's lunchtime, so about 35 minutes. Uh, I get to talk to you about subnets. Uh, same principle as the first uh, lecture. I'm going to try and give you the unadulterated truth. I'm not going to lie to you, really, about what, how they work. I'm not going to mislead you. I'm going to try and give you the tools to go and build good things and some motivation to do so. Um, I'm going to try not to completely uh, cover the screen as I talk, walk, but I, my, I do, my slides are there. And also, th there's some echo chamber going on here. So hopefully everyone can still see the stuff. Um, so we're going to talk about subnets, uh, and then after lunch we've got more technical, uh, kind of hands-on building stuff. Um, but I think subnets are the coolest thing about Avalanche, so great for you. Uh, so first of all, I want to start with a, an obvious thing. We talked about it in the first session. It's been a really wild few days in the crypto market. I would contend, I've only been in crypto for four years, it's definitely the craziest I've seen. Maybe people who've been here since 2014, it's not as crazy, but it's kind of like been crazy. And obviously, you know why it's been crazy. It's been crazy because um, one of the major ecosystems has gone to zero <laughs> in less than a week. An ecosystem that but uh, two months ago did a huge partnership with Avalanche, uh, a partnership of the e that ecosystem was bigger. <laughs> and it has gone to zero. Now, this is incredible. I don't think you like, it's obviously incredible because it's brought the whole market down with it. But it's incredible that something so big, a too big to fail, went down. And I think it raises big questions about what the future of blockchain is going to be that I think you should confront now, especially if you are a developer. Now, you can, of course, go along for the ride and be fun, and the price goes up, you build good dApps. But I think in the long term, you want to have a position about why you think blockchain is going to be something, especially if you're willing to stake your career on it. And hopefully, I can give you those tools now. I do want to talk about the Terra situation for a moment. Uh, we might think, well, how is that related to subnets? You'll see in a moment. So what happened with Terra, for those of you that know or don't, well, who thinks they know how it, what happened? Not, the, the, not, the, not the, the what, the how. Okay. How, what happened? Explain. How did it happen? But how did, who, can anyone tell me how the block, Black Swan happened? Go. No. Different. Anyone know how did the Black Swan happen? Does anyone know the actual mechanics, the maths by which it happened? No. It's actually a very simple, like. Why is that important? What was Luna doing? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So a very simple thing happened, and this is the extraordinary thing about like it going wrong, is so there was the thing called UST, a stable coin. That stable coin was backed by Luna. It had some collateral, about 17% worth, but the rest of it was Luna. Luna was the collateral. 
And every time the UST went too low, they would sell Luna and buy UST to peg it kind of back up, back to $1. Now, of course, that works when that kind of Luna is worth a lot of money, specifically above $50, which it was. It was all-time high a month ago. Um, but what happens if it goes below 50? There is not enough money to cover on one-to-one -one collateral or the UST. So what they did is they started minting new Luna. What happened though, UST keeps going down and they keep minting new Luna. And at no point, and they keep doing it and the price keeps going down, keeps going down. Like the Luna is now, you're diluting the supply, you're keeping more supply on the market to try and, again, to try and then sell it, to try and buy USTT to push it back up. Um, you can't see to losing the supply. If you, cru you dilute the supply of something, the price is going to go down. This keeps happening. The crazy thing was, you might be saying, why didn't they just stop increasing the supply of Luna? Like, call UST dead. Like, Terra is an ecosystem bigger than UST. Why did they not just say, turn the off switch on, or turn the off switch off, somewhere around, put the, press the off switch and go, we are not going to support UST anymore. We are not going to keep diluting the supply. Because obviously, if we keep diluting the supply, so even until last night, the supply of Luna was increasing. <laughs> and that is why it is now worth a like, tiny decimal. It is now, it has gone to zero. They kept increasing the supply. You might be thinking, wait, this is like the dumbest thing ever. Like you've just brought, they've brought down a whole ecosystem. A whole ecosystem has gone to zero. So much stuff was built on it. Like forget USD, so much, so much was built on it. Was that necessary? It raises big questions. It raises massive questions about who runs blockchains, who's in charge of them, like whether we should regulate it. It's a really actually scary moment, quite frankly. I don't think crypto is going away by any means. I think it is kind of too big to fail. It's kind of very hard to regulate without banning it. But it asks questions about what you want it to be in the future. Because like, this was a really stupid system design. That like, it was like, then the reason you might be saying, why is everyone saying this? Everyone's kind of thinking they really aren't going to keep like, supporting UST, are they? Like, as Luna goes to zero. Like, it's ridiculous when you say it out loud. So you might be thinking, what the hell has this got to do with subnets? Um, well, it raises questions about how we want to design our blockchains in the future uh, and what we want the rules to be. And subnets is about rules. Um, and I think you've got to ask yourself, what will blockchain actually become? Because, like, right now, I think I can make a fairly powerful contention, and I say this having, um, I run a company that is fundraised in blockchain. I invest as an investor in blockchain. I, I, we hire and place people. We train people. But it is quite clear at this point that the biggest use case of a blockchain and a token is the, to be a speculative casino asset. <laughs> it's like anyone who's been in crypto long enough kind of realizes this. Then the underpinning of this is really cool technology doing good thing, but the product is not the protocol. The product is the token that you bet on. It's a gambling thing. And I don't think that is what the end future of blockchain needs to be. Um, like this is not, this doesn't seem to be the kind of idealistic, idealistic vision of being able to send money on the internet in seconds or be able to build complex financial products that they become like a version of like Bet365. That seems suboptimal. Um, so we have to ask the question, what do we want blockchain to become? And it's not, I don't think, it's fun, the money bits, but like it won't last forever. It's not to become a speculative asset. Use the technology. So the question is, can you have the technology persisting while you have it being open and public and permissionless? This is the problem. Because there's a few thing, features of blockchain that is, that is um, kind of intrinsic, is that anyone can build, anyone can participate, anyone can validate. Um, you don't have to ask anyone's permission. It's completely decentralized. Um, these were things seen as the good things, but it comes with the flip side. It comes with bad aspects. Specifically, like, I don't know about you, but I think KYC is kind of a good thing. <laughs> a lot of you would think, like, in this room, 2000, 2008 financial crash, bad. And, like, the only kind of solution, like, you basically got two solutions in that case. You either say, like, no, no, it was the rules. It's the bad rules. It's, like, too many rules. I don't think you could make this argument compellingly. But like, you can either say, like, well, let the system govern itself. This was a product of, kind of um, adverse incentives. Kind of bad argument, you're not going to win. You kind of, say regulation was not well written. Maybe there wasn't enough. 
So you've got a fairly strong contention <laughs> with the thing that, like, <laughs> the biggest event really in the last 15 years, the financial crash, that KYC, background checks, regulation, probably a good thing. Like, we can talk about the specifics of that. I'm British, we just left the EU, we don't really like regulation. Like, but, like, kind of, we can make a compelling argument that rules are good. Furthermore, paternalism is kind of good. Like, we don't let people sell organs. <laughs> we don't let children kind of go to work. Like, there are some necessity at an extreme level to have basic rules. And kind of in crypto, there aren't really many rules. <laughs> um, like, the whole point is that there is no one to set the rules, so we have to agree them between each other. And we kind of tend to agree with rules that, like, are focused on speculation. It's so like, if I could make a compelling argument that KYC, regulation and paternalism, are broadly good things in the systems I want to live in, and I haven't even talked about good governance yet, and democratic structures, then like maybe public permissionless blockchains aren't actually going to be a huge thing, like eventually. Maybe we need some version, some middle ground for the future. Uh, and that's where subnets kind of come in. Uh, and again, I'll kind of talk about kind of governance and system change. Um, the only thing I know well I think in this world, the only thing I've actually studied to any level um, was politics. Um, politics is mostly bullshit, House of Cards pretty much has it covered, but system change is really interesting, and how things move to democracy is really interesting, and it's pretty much always like there's an existent existential power that threatens the existing like king, and the king goes like, do you know what I need like, to stay in power? I'm going to have to include more people in power. So like, I'll do a different form of government. Maybe I'll like, go for a democracy. And so you, have, like, you start off with a democracy that favors the majority. And the majority goes like, then the majority like, kind of gets unpopular because all the big guys kind of fail eventually. And it's like, well, do you know what? We'll have a thing where we'll have a, we'll have a polarity system. I don't need a majority win. I just need like 40%. We have this in the UK. It's called a polarity system. And it's like, I only need 40% and I'll be the governing party. And that's great. And then it's like, um, okay, well, no, we're not winning anymore. Do you know what we fancy? Proportional government. will power share. Like, great. And then this is how basically all, like, if you look at the history of system change, this is like, you go dictatorship to kind of monarchy, to republic, to democracy, to different forms of democracy. Um, and if you apply this logic that things only change when there's this existential kind of power and threats, I don't really see blockchain yet as that threat that's going to change the system. Like, it's going to be the case that blockchain is embraced within the system that's kind of now, because that system has the KYC and the governance and the like paternalism that we think of broadly good things, even if we can't agree on the specifics. Um, which leaves us to a situation, which fairly, I think, controversially, and I don't think you should see subnets without controversy, that there will be some sort of hybrid in how we build blockchain systems. They will not be big, public, openless, open and ruleless. There will be KYC. There will be permissioned actors. There will be rules for engaging in the game. Um, because if you... <laughs> eventually, you won't really want the, the terror situations. You won't want the case that due to like a 20-year-old in his underwear like building a system and like not really caring and maybe quite frankly, incentives being a bit uh, misaligned, a system was allowed to go to zero, <laughs> causing a lot of trouble to everyone. Like, what if that had been, like, a different stable coin? Uh, that, that is really bad. Um, so maybe the future is some hybrid. Like, and I think this is controversial. Because, like, maybe this is a permissioned blockchain. Like, the th principles that you like about blockchain might not be the principles that are in the, where blockchain goes in 10 years. At the very least, it is the contention of the way Avalanche is built, not to say what you should build. You can build a permissionless blockchain. You can have permissioned, uh, permission, permissionless as, as you want it. But to actually say, we are going to give you the tools to build any kind of blockchain you want. And it is a, basically a call to TradFine, to banks, to say, OK, we have this amazing thing, which is a clearly much more efficient version of what you're doing. I think that's obvious to anyone that's ever sent money in crypto. Um, now we're going to try and... Um, embrace or add these, this toolkit into what you're doing in banking, make it much more efficient. And it clearly, um, you can't have a public permissionless um, thing there that banks need to do KYC for obvious reasons. So maybe the future is permission blockchains. Uh, and I don't think you should take that lightly. So now we get into what is a subnet. So subnet is a avalanche effectively version of, uh, this is actually slightly false, allowing permission blockchains. It is actually the toolkit by which you can create your own blockchain with your own rules. It does not have opinions on whether that's what those rules should be. You could actually create a, your own permissionless blockchain on avalanche. Um, you just, um, 
But you, I think you would just use the C chain for that. Um, or I don't see why you necessarily do that. We can talk about different use cases um, throughout the session. Um, it has its own set of validators. Uh, so a specific set of validators, I, a specific set of people who are in charge of it. Um, and again, you might see a, let's say, a bank, Morgan Stanley, having their own subnet. And they said the validators were Morgan Stanley validators or Morgan Stanley approved validators. And you have all the features of a blockchain that you like. It's an EVM maybe, um, but the fundamental thing is on the validator level, it is controlled by Kind of centralized parties, scary. Um, and the validators work together to achieve consensus um, on that blockchain. You can still use the key thing out the box here is we're going to use Avalanche consensus. So we're going to say, look, Avalanche consensus works. We talk about that in the first talk. Um, it's good, it's fast, it's scalable. Uh, Emin Gunsira is quite a smart man, like, especially when you hear him speak. It's quite compelling. I think it's a reasonable contention that, that Avalanche, con uh, Avalanche consensus is very good. It's a great engine. And like with Formula E, if we can hearken to that, sometimes like, it's just good enough to provide a great engine and let someone else build the rest. The subnets. You can, you, the, Avalanche is giving its great engine. Uh, it's giving the power, it's giving the horsepower, it's giving the powertrain, and it's saying to you, go and build everything else in whatever way you see fit. Um, each blockchain is validated by exactly one subnet. So subnet is a set of validators. Each blockchain is validated by exactly one subnet. And a subnet can obviously validate many blockchains. So Morgan Stanley can have as many blockchains as they like. Or oh, the Morgan Stanley validator sets can have as many blockchains as they like. Uh, and a node can be a member of many subnets. That bit's less important. And the subnet manages its own membership. Um, and again, that membership could be everyone can be a member. So the Avalanche C chain is itself a subnet. <laughs> it is a subnet that is run, a kind of, well, it's not run, it's uh, set up by Avalanche or OI Avalabs, um, and now is completely in the community's hands um, to uh, be an EVM uh, and to allow you to do all the things you do in Ethereum um, on it. But I can imagine a different situation where, for instance, I want to only allow a particular set of trading firms. Or I might want to say, um, you have to go through this KYC process, and I have to kind of, and maybe I could do that in a decentralized way. And I have to agree you're a good actor based in these localities that I'm allowed to operate in for you to then do all the blockchain things. Now, clearly, you've got other issues here, which is like, perhaps. Um, you can't have as much interoperability <laughs> between different blockchains. If you've got membership, kind of this kind of pool of members, you don't want e people to easily contribute to your network. But again, I could build a sand pit that you could use Aave. Like, like the Aave is a very good example of um, one of the leading DeFi protocols that are trying to set up a subnet. I could set up my own subnet for Aave that's just meant for a particular set of banks, and they would get access to having their own lending markets and Aave. Anyone who's used it, it's really fun and quick to do lending on Aave or Compound or any of the above. Um, then you've got a kind of private kind of playpen to do lending. And it would probably be a really big playpen. And it would probably have a lot of users. And it would probably have a lot of actors. And it would probably have a lot of capital. And it'd probably be really efficient and fun. And that's a kind of version of the future I could get behind. Like Aave, but for banks, <laughs> is cool. Maybe what you lose is all of like the innovation as part of that. And I think it's a fair contention to say that rules limit innovation, uh, they limit creativity, and perhaps um, uh, the quality, the, the great thing about blockchain and Web3 is that you can kind of take the baton from anyone. There's many, uh, many batons. If you see someone else doing good work, you can copy that work and make it better. Um, or you can, you can fork something and go again. That is a very powerful concept. Um, that It comes from permissionlessness. And you get instances where 20-year-olds run financial systems in the billions. That's cool. Maybe that's bad. That's really cool. Uh, and it, I guess the accessibility point of blockchain is, is really powerful. Um, and again, I, I really want to strongly suggest, strongly emphasize, a subnet and avalanche has no opinion on what that membership should be. It is simply providing the technology and the framework as a toolkit for you to do what you want with it. 
it is probably the contention of Avalabs and my contention that the world will look the world of blockchain will look very different in 10 years that does not mean the world now will not continue to be the case and I might be completely wrong and that is fine you can still use subnets but it is about giving the toolkit once you have consensus which is the really hard bit for you to then build your own VMs we'll talk about a virtual machine and your own smart contract platforms on top of it to do cool things now, obviously, there is a thing here which you might be saying, what if I want to innovate on the consensus bit? <laughs> That's hard. Well, you can go. You can fork Avalanche's consensus and impro improve it. It's like there are plenty of new layer ones kind of popping up at the moment. There's been a bit of a, I, I would say, an investment um, uh, zeitgeist in new layer ones um, for various reasons. Um, you could do that yourself. Um, they still, we still have that fundamental principle of blockchain. Um, but uh, you have to, consensus is hard, and um, the consensus protocols are really hard. Uh, so maybe you might want to just use the framework and the easiness that Avalanche has created. And I, I've spoke to a lot of you already in this room who are like, I want, want to have the features of a blockchain, but I want to do it for my specific use case. Um, so that's a kind of solution there. Um, there's not really many examples of alternatives. You've got Hyperledger Fabric, which is not really used much anymore. Parachains on Polkadot was pretty similar. Um, but I don't think any, many of them give you as much out the hood as subnets, really. But uh, we can talk about that. So as you said, this structure allows the addition of KYC requirements, locality, ML licenses. And we're basically beginning to allow DeFi primitives to be used in TradFi. Um, out of interest, what a people think about this? Like, I don't think what I'm saying is without strong controversy. So does anyone have any particular views on if this is a good thing or a bad thing? Ah, very good. Uh, I need to define my terms. What is TradFi? Can someone tell me? Traditional finance. And DeFi is? Decentralized finance. Um, so who thinks, who can give me compelling arguments? Some nets are bad. Uh, I'm happy to be proven wrong here. I think so. Um, what would be so? Settlement is. Why would they? Well, it depends what you mean by centralized kind of database. Because, like, what a blockchain system it does, it's it's very good for allowing people to kind of um, transact with each other and build applications. Like, it is a database structure. Like, it is a, like. By the way, a permission blockchain is a centralized database. Like, it is. It's a centralized database that allows specific features and the building of things called smart contracts and decentralized applications. So like, you're basically saying, like, why don't they just build their own app and sandpit? <laughs> and I was like, well, why would you need to? Like, blockchain's really good at settlement, really good at trading between someone, and really good at like, rebuilding the financial system, uh, real, real building how you transact based on kind of moving value between computers rather than needing to rely on a concept, an external concept of money, if you see what I mean. Like, it, it's, you, do, you don't... A lot of the work is done for you in a blockchain system, whereas, like, again, if you're going to build a centralized database, you're basically saying you need to use fiat. And like, the problem with fiat is the banking system as designed is really slow. Like, who, who kind of knows how banking works now? Can anyone give me a good explanation of like, how... I want you to explain to me. Are you actually, you put your hand up before, now you're screwed. Um, explain to me how I move money to America from the UK. So what happens? What's happening behind the hood? Yeah. 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 It's effectively they have in a weird way the same system now. Like it's a it's a long chain of communication and messaging to say like something new has happened and value has moved. Um, but like what also happens is there's you've heard there's there's Swift and there's like many others like it. Like obviously we had all the Swiss stuff with Russia. Like all these systems have to talk to each other. It's like a slow process. Blockchain basically says like here's a more efficient way of doing that database structure, and we're all going to have the same one. So like in basic terms, every world is divided, has lots of different banking systems, lots of different ways of doing this, and it's also legacy software. This is like the twenty kind of the the the. the the 2020 update of that is the way I'd see it. That's, that's why Morgan Stanley would want to use it. Um, it's the nice version of Swift. It's the more updated version of Swift, if in a permission context, um, if that, that makes sense. 
Yeah. 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 It is powerful. Um, but it's powerful. <laughs> um, it's certainly, yeah, consequential. Uh, again, I'm try trying to, good or bad is up to you um, with how these systems work. Um, but yeah, we were able to cut Russia out of the financial system. Again, good or bad. Probably good, looks like in this context, to cut them out. Um, they, they, were, they have turned to other alternatives, and crypto is one of them. Um, maybe that's bad. I don't know. Um, anyone have a compelling argument against a subnet? Against the concept? Yeah. Uh, against. Against. I want to, I want to hear the negatives. But again, well, uh, yes, but then I would say, just because Morgan Stanley build their own sand pit does not mean we cannot have other sand pits <laughs> that have the same principles. This is not a, crypto can still exist as it does now. This is like, well, TradFi can start using crypto concepts. Um, people can still do everything you do now. That's the contention of subnets. You can still do everything you do now. But we're gonna give you the ability to do versions of it on a spectrum from very private to very public. Yeah. Maybe it's a question of there's liquidity that isn't entering the game because there aren't the frameworks in place to allow it. Like, like Morgan Stanley cannot allow its trading infrastructure to go through crypto because it has to, uh, it has to regulate actors. That, uh, it has to um, KYC know who the actors it deal with are. So I can actually make the opposite argument. Like, liquidity will stay the same. Nothing changed in that factor. There's not more liquidity going to a system that someone can act. But maybe that same young developer could be building dApps within the Morgan Stanley sandpit of liquidity, which is a bigger one. Who knows? Maybe they do. I don't know. It's not, it, doesn't have a, it doesn't have an opinion. I, I agree with you. They might not. But um, the technology is still open source. Now, the question is whether adv advances in the technology become private source, and then this is, becomes just a database structure like the chap over here alluded to. That is worrying. Um, not, it's not Avalanche's contention, is all I would say. And that's important to say. Yeah. Sorry, say that again. Really good question. Uh, so, um, validators can see what's going on. So if I'm a validator, uh, how many AVAX do I need to be a validator? 2,000, good, well remembered. Um, then I can see what's going on. Um, but it is likely to be the case that um, I suspect there would not be an Avascat of all the subnets, uh, each individual subnet of what's going on. You don't want, there's some transactions you don't want, you do want to have privacy built in. So yes, but is that not kind of like, again, in the, again we're talking about subnets are a subset of, financial, of the financial system. There are some things we do want to be private, no? Like, where are some transactions we don't want people to know about? Like, rather than go, like, I think it's, it's a bit scary, uh, actually, the crypto solution to privacy, which is like some of the zero knowledge stuff and also things like Monero, which are like, there's like, <laughs> yeah, like, they, really, if you use Monero, you really can't see what's happening. And that means it really could be used for criminal purposes. Like, we don't really want that to be the case. So, yes, you're right to say there is much less transparency, but that's kind of in the base assumptions. And it still doesn't mean you can't be, like, the C chain is still transparent. Everyone can still like, build as they normally do. It's just like the Morgan Stanley moat, yes, it will not be transparent. You will not be able to see what's happening on a second by second basis. But maybe that's a good thing for some, act, for, for, for some things. Do you want people to know you're buying a house? Like, and how much you paid for that house? Like, maybe. 
But yeah, again, this, uh, this is why I'm kind of taking a more philosophical approach to this talk, because it's like, it's kind of, yeah, the tech is cool. Tech is early. Tech broadly works. The consequences are really interesting. Like, what happens next? Why? Whether it should. Should is a very difficult term. Um, the whole point of crypto is not to have opinions on what should happen. Uh, it's what can happen. Uh, whereas this is kind of maybe risks a situation where you start letting people dictate the should of technology, which is dangerous. Uh, sorry, other things. Go. What would you say on the short answer to people that want to use the public blockchain, purchase the blockchain for B2B application, and scare from the very large industry, instead of using a subnet that the really is proposing? Yeah, so basically you're asking, like, Hyperledger versus subnet. <laughs> um, so I think you, it's a consensus question. So there's an, also kind of a there's a cheat as well, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, so this is like a, the first question is what's the consensus? I mean, um, I like um, Snowman. We talked about it in the first session. I think it's very fast. Um, try it. Try and do a transaction. Um, and basically, you get all that for free with a subnet. Um, and you get again a lot of the frameworks. So it's a framework. It's not a it's not a panacea. It's a framework. Um, so that's the first decision. Like, do you like Avalanche consensus? And also, how easy is it to build stuff on top of it? So Avalanche, we'll talk about, uses Go. Um, Go is nice. I like Go. Uh, and it allows you to build any kind of VM, which basically means any kind of environment in which to build smart contracts or anything you want a blockchain to do. Um, and it's a bit like, I keep with blockchains, I keep using the analogy of a car. And I think it's very appropriate with Formula E. We've done a lot of work um, in the Solana ecosystem as well. And that's a really hard language to get your. Uh, the, the particular Solana opinion of Rust is an incredibly hard thing to get your uh, your uh, get the hang of. It's like driving like uh, any like kind of sports cars. It's like driving like a stripped down car that is like just the wheel and the engine. It's amazing. You feel every vibration. My God, it's horrible to drive, um, but it's great if you know how to drive it. Whereas like subnets are kind of like again, we gave you the engine. We'll give you all the parts. Like it's all there. Go and put together what you want. Which might not be what everyone wants. That might be kind of too hard. And there'll be layers and abstractions to kind of build, kind of make that process easier. But I think it, first question, consensus. Second question, what are you trying to build? Third question, how much ability do you have to build it? Um, and the last thing I want to say, you could do something really cheeky, which is you could fork Avalanche and just like have your own set of validators, which is kind of what you're doing here. Like, but you could just fork Avalanche and then like make it private if you did want to take a different approach. That's my like hacky. Okay, okay. Uh, yes. You would need to you would need to run validators. That's Slightly uh, screwed for time, so I'm going to rush through now and take questions at the end if that's all right. Um, so, um, you can, so we talked about transparency there. You can uh, keep the contents of the chain visible, or you can just make it valid. So again, you have optionality here. You can do whatever you want. Um, it's a toolkit. It's not. A, it doesn't have an opinion on what you actually should do with it. Um, it also, like, this also means that you can, obviously, the subnet model allows validators to only concern themselves with blockchains they care about, um, which, again, like Morgan Stanley might want to validate their own. They might not want to validate the main chain. Um, it also allows us to have validators with specific hardware requirements. So you talked about gaming. Like, maybe you want, that, that you want to be able to like, have validators with tons of RAM or tons of CPU. Um, I talked a little bit earlier. Don't run games on a blockchain. It's really bad. Uh, it'd be really inefficient. But we can talk about that specifically. Uh, run the assets. Don't run the game itself. But maybe in the future, that will change. Um, 
so uh, importantly, uh, this is uh, really important. Um, what it, you're allowed to do with that kind of subnet is basically create your own virtual machine. Um, a virtual machine defines the low-level logic of a blockchain. Basically, the state, the state transition function, the API to interact with it. Um, every blockchain on Avalanche, every blockchain is an instance of a VM, a virtual machine. Um, you don't need to worry about, as we said, networking consensus structure of the blockchain. That's abstracted away uh, when you kind of use the subnet. Um, but um, you have to build your own VM. Now, what you can do, I wanted to do a little bit of coding. It'll at least it'll show you some stuff. I'm going to show you, not kind of go through it. Um, you can just fork Ethereum. So you can have your own one that is, has your own set of validators that is just an Ethereum virtual machine, runs like Ethereum. Ethereum virtual machine, EVM, just means it works like Ethereum. Uh, and this can, you can just use Solidity and write smart contracts. You could have your own Solana virtual machine, um, C time it's called. Uh, you could have your own um, Terra one if you really so wanted to. Uh, 100, by the way, 100% there will be a fork of Terra that emerges in the next like couple of years uh, that kind of gets the band back together. Um, but there, to build a VM, you write it in Go. Uh, there's more languages to come. Um, and uh, yeah, now this allows us to build new private blockchains. Um, the C chain is an example of a subnet um, and an EVM. Um, and we've already kind of talked very nicely about this allows us to have private versions of DeFi. Uh, and um, yeah, um, you can specify specific languages, specific functionality. And um, yeah, uh, this is all pretty much repeating it. Um, what I do want to not go over these, uh, we've kind of talked about this, um, is just show, highlight a few particularly good docs. Uh, we're not unfortunately been able to, so sort of running behind. Go over, but I just want to highlight a few things. Oh, why is that link not working? Ah, oh, very good. Uh, so a few docs. Um, one, uh, this is excellent. Why are you not working? Oh, that's so slow. Uh, let's see. Sorry, it's actually very painful to run this. Uh, so uh, I highly recommend the GitHub. Uh, which will talk you through uh, in everything I've done. You'll notice the first bit. This is now so slow, I'm not going to do it. It will talk you through setting up something. It will talk, well, the tutorials, I think we're doing it later um, on the kind of EVM side. Uh, it will talk you through kind of creating an EVM subnet, which seems like the most basic one. It will then kind of talk you through how you create your own kind of blockchains. Like, that's the harder one, using Go. The most simple thing I think you should do as a dev is simply in testnet, the testnet is Wagme, uh, for kind of creating subnets, um, is just like create your own, create your own instance of Ethereum uh, running as a subnet. Be really cool. Um, obviously, you don't need to deploy it because you need your own validators. Like you need to get the agreement of validators. Um, but you can definitely run your own test one. And sorry, the docs aren't showing very well. This is now like slowed my computer down to zero, which is hilarious. Um, Anyway, I highly recommend GitHub, uh, subnet docs, go and look through there, and it will take you very neatly through kind of um, building your first subnet, how you'd add validators. Um, oh, no. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and now everyone can see my little ant. Um, but we'll leave that be. Um, anyway, um, that takes us neatly to lunch, a bit more of a philosophical one. Sorry we didn't get into on the coding side. Luckily, I have an afternoon of lots of coding for you this afternoon. So if you want to get your laptop out, you want to build something live, we have Anchor, we have Chainlink, we have three different Avalanche uh, devs. We're doing front end, we're doing Avalanche JS, we're doing building your own kind of stateful EVM. We finished with a bit of kind of more DeFi stuff with Superfluid. So we've tried to give you the building blocks this morning. Hopefully you now, we're all on the same page. Avalanche is cool, consensus is cool. You can just build Ethereum stuff on the C chain. But if you want to do the kind of sexy stuff, you want to build your own subnet. Subnets do not have an opinion on what you should build, but allow you to build permission environments in which you can build any type of blockchain of your choosing. This is obviously can get incredibly difficult to build complicated ones, but blockchains are difficult. You can just build your own sandbox for Ethereum that might be the future of uh, finance. Um, it is lunch, so I don't want to take off any uh, kind of time on general questions. Come and find me um, at the front. Otherwise, it's been a pleasure. I will see you later today, guys, and thank you very much.